Hello, everyone. Welcome back, or welcome for the first time, uh, to Libraries in Response. This is our now kind of long-running uh, series of uh, sessions around a number of different uh, technology issues that um, affect libraries, starting with, with uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, now approaching four full years since that happened uh, as libraries in response. And uh, today we're going to focus on another challenge, crisis, as we would uh, identify the arrival in full flower, not only in full flower, but in a new level anyway of, of uh, AI and the opportunities and challenges around that. Uh, we have Andrew Cox uh, from the AI Special Interest Group of IFLA, and we have Richard Witt, uh, president of GLIA Foundation. Uh, I think we linked, uh, yeah, we did link to both of them in the registration, and uh, then from that, you could find their respective uh, institutions. Richard, I, I'd appreciate it if you'd uh, post the GLIA link in the chat as well. Thank you. So <clears throat> we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, a 13, 14-year-old consortium of open collaboration of libraries doing interesting, innovative things with technology. Uh, and we are hosted and recorded today as always by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions with Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA at the helm in The Hague or The Hague's proximity. Our sponsor is the Institute for in uh, Museum and Library Services, IMLS, the uh, US Federal Agency for Libraries and Museums, and we appreciate their support. We started out, as I mentioned, focusing on the COVID pandemic. It was like, you know, everybody was freaking out. What is this all about? What do we have to do? Uh, what does it mean? What is it? What What's a library if the building is closed? Is it nothing? No, it's something. But what? And 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 that went on from there, and it it just became a uh, uh, almost a cascade of crises through the year and on since. So. There was the, the the health crisis, and then, of course, the, the background climate crisis really asserted itself last year, the hottest hottest year on record in, I don't know, 100,000 years. I mean, this is, this is kind of trumps almost everything else, really. Um, and then we had this, the political crises and outbreaks of violence, and, you know, it hasn't quite gotten to this point, but yet, maybe. And then, of course, we have this new new challenge, this this thing, this phenomena, this uh, this technology, which is pervasive uh, in our environment, and it became you know visible a year ago, a little over a year ago, with the uh, arrival of the uh, of ChatGPT and as a kind of a public facing end user tool. Before that, had been actively used by enterprises in uh, managing their companies and managing their customers. Uh, and now it's, uh, you know, kind of top of mind. Uh, policies are being generated right and left. This is our favorite slide. This kind of compiles everything, combines everything into one, one uh, image. And uh, the, the world is longing for the good old days of the Cold War when all you had to worry about was nuclear annihilation. Uh, well, yeah, okay. Uh, so imagine that there's a there's a global network of connected libraries that are working together to address all these and more challenges and strengthening the the humanity uh, to deal with these crises. This is kind of our our vision that it's. It's an institution that is very old, and generally it's at the local level, which is mostly where these are are supported, 
are highly trusted in institutions and individuals, the librarians themselves. That's that asset is of course taken for granted by almost everybody, but it it's rising up in its importance as everything else in terms of trust declines. It's not like libraries are more trusted. It's just they're more trusted in comparison to everybody else. And I think that will continue. Um, AI is software, according to Vince Cerf, the man who uh, in, invented the internet, co-invented the internet uh, as an experiment in communica global communications uh, many decades ago, uh, says that AI will do what you tell it to, it's software, but it may not do what you want it to. Yeah, it's sort of the King Midas uh, phenomena. Uh, to us, it looks like these are chain reactions of instructions. You give it a command, you set it loose, and it does stuff. A lot of times these instructions conflict with other instructions, and those have to resolve or just stop at some point, uh, or they resolve in some unpredictable way, and we start to see the rise of this phenomena. So here's our uh, entry into the uh, principles to inform AI models. Do as librarians do. I mean, it, it maybe it's kind of a little Pollyanna, but imagine you're an AI and you're searching all the information about how librarians behave, how libraries serve the public. What could be a better model for benevolence and support? And also, there's a massive amount of information for it to uh, train on. We'll see how that goes, but uh, that's that's our proposal. Um. Uh, there are there are challenges, of course, and, and here, here are a couple of them. One is an existential challenge, you know, the prospects for humanity. Uh, there's now a P-Doom uh, monitor when you predict the probability or the possibility that AI will uh, cause extinction of humanity. So it ranges anywhere from 5% to 100%. But even five percent on is, on the low end is you know it's significant. I mean, if somebody tells you that you had a five percent chance your you know house would fall down tomorrow, you'd do something about it. Well, we're trying to do something about it, but you know not that fast because people are so adaptable. Humans are so adaptable. It's like today is not that different from yesterday, and you know whatever. So we've gone from two billion to eight billion people in what 75, 80 years. Unbelievable. Well, you know, yeah, okay. <laughs> What's on TV? You know, who's who's playing this tonight in the you know in the Super Bowl? Um, and then there's personal, uh, and, and and this is you know these are things that are happening right now. The the idea of a, a guide or a co-pilot, something that is helping us as individuals, or guiding us, or or uh, convincing us, or even coercing us into certain kinds of behavior. So. You know, as with humanity's prospects, there's the positive side that it could help us solve climate change or or change, you know, uh, the, the nature of work and, and learning. Learning, especially, I think, is a is a huge one. Uh, and then the personal it also has the ups and the downside. And there's a practical, you know, like today at the office. What, what does it mean to our work, our our plan for the year? And, and so this is. This is what's arrived in the past couple of months. So the U.S. Uh, administration uh, initiated, uh, issued this uh, executive order on AI actions in October, I believe it was. And the, so I meant all the agencies of this massive institution are having to incorporate these practices and principles into their operations. Not so simple, but they're, they're obviously they're working on it. According to this article in in Fed Scoop from just a couple of days ago, and then there's at the state level you have similar kinds of actions. You've got the seventeen. I think it may be, I think it may be more now. Uh, states have uh, enacted bills, uh, uh, especially if you include the task forces that have been created to address this, and uh, and executive orders from from governors. So this is. This itself is a chain reaction of policy that's causing a, a need for addressing by uh, by state libraries, by local libraries. 
And on that point of the challenges to local libraries or libraries in general, this is accelerating a certain level of capability that people have using the internet. It also at the same time is, I would pose it's widening this digital divide. I've been wondering what, what AI news about AI sounds like to somebody that that's not even really connected to the internet. They may have a minimal connection to the internet. What is that sound like? I mean, I think all of us here, obviously, because we're online, we have some, you know, level of experience with the internet and how it serves us and all that. And already this has been a, a, a challenge and a problem. How do we, how do we bring everybody into it or how do we give everybody an opportunity, an option to participate in this, this global digital conversation? And so now we've got this, this new tool, this active agent uh, infusing this environment. So I don't know, but I suspect as it has been proven that people that are not connected, they live in communities that are underserved, are not happy about it because the kids will all leave town. You know, there's no opportunity. No companies will move in because they just can't operate without the internet. And so these towns are, you know, they're, they're fading, they're dying. And that obviously reasonably rationally leads to uh, desperation, anxiety, fear, anger, and acting out. So this is not a, a, a good social environment. So let's get to the business of the day, uh, which is our, our speakers, not me. I um, made a kind of a long opening here, but welcome again. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Richard to, to lead us off. Richard, uh, as a president of the Glia Foundation, has for years now been focusing on these challenges and how, how we can cope with the the what we have, have called big AI. Uh, only the largest, most powerful companies, technology companies, can really play so far have been able to play in this. You have to have massive resources to create these models and train these uh, these different uh, uh, algorithms. And so where does that leave the rest of us or where does that even leave small challengers to it? Andrew uh, will will follow Richard and Andrew uh, is our anchor uh, for the session today because he has generated this uh, this uh, taxonomy, this, this outline of, of a, a strategy for response by libraries to, to AI. And I hope everybody had a chance to look at that uh, in detail. It's exhaustive, but it's really an excellent piece of work. So with that, I will turn it over to Richard. Welcome back, Richard. This is our, this is our, I got our third AI related session over the past few years, and we've had a lot of <laughs> conversation about it. So Tell us what's, what's what. Yeah, well, thank you, Don, for having me back a third time. Um, maybe the third time is a charm, we'll see. Um, obviously, a ton's been going on in AI in recent months and over the past couple of years, really. Um, as I see it, I'm just gonna have a few observations here, kick off the conversation, maybe throw a few questions on the table. Andrew, obviously, um, is working closely in this space and has, I think, some very important things to convey, and then we can open this up to a conversation. So I'm glad you invoked uh, Vince Surf at the outset, um, Don, because uh, among other things, uh, Vince has been a friend of mine over the past 20 plus years and a mentor. Uh, he has a saying that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So I have no PowerPoint slides today. I'm just gonna, again, put a few ideas out here and hopefully start a conversation. So Vince uh, and Bob Kahn, as you noted, back in 1974, put out the original white paper of the TCP IP protocol, which is the basically the connectivity fabric of the, of the internet. 14 years later, they put out another paper, which has gotten much less accolade, but I think, uh, I think particularly today deserves our attention. I'm actually dropping it in the chat right now. And the, the uh, title is an open architecture for a digital library system and a plan for its development. And what Bob and, and Vin did in this paper was talk through what they saw as the need um, to create this sort of universal digital library 
But an important part of it that, um, again, I'd like to bring into the conversation today is in addition to that, they, they saw what they called no-bots, which were these agents, digital agents, that were active intelligent programs that could interact with each other, move around freely, interact with the library and its infrastructure, and help people, the users, assemble their own personal library systems that interacted as well. So this very uh, sort of robust approach towards thinking through the digital ecosystem that a library would occupy. And just to be clear, this is before the web, this is 1988. So the web is not yet out there in commercial sense. So they were really sort of looking ahead to where both the web and its architecture might end up, but also where AI might end up. And so if you fast forward, of course, to last year, we've seen the explosion of all of the, the generative AI conversations, large language models. Um, you, you have, by any accounts, the major players contributing 80 to 90% of the actual uh, resource in terms of their own cash outlay, their own computational resources, their own employee base, um, their own market power into the dialogue. So relatively few companies, the ones we know the names of, of course, Microsoft, Google, OpenAI, which of course has now some fairly indirect, but maybe more directly so influenced from, my, from Microsoft um, and a few others like Meta who've done an open source version. So the large language models have become the thing um, and people have been using things like ChatGPT um, but now as, 220, as 2023 has been sort of the, the realm of the large language models, my perspective sitting in the middle of Silicon Valley for what it's worth, is that 2024 is gonna be the year of the digital bot, the personal digital assistant, uh, the no bot as it were. Um, we're seeing signs of this already, right? So OpenAI just in the last couple of weeks has opened up um, uh, their, their online app store for something they're calling the GPT which is its own intelligent agent that interacts with the underlying large language model. Um, and people can actually program it and provide certain, so far fairly limited tasks, you know, help manage my calendar, help me put together a grocery list, things like that. But over time, it's, good, it's clearly going to evolve into more interesting, more important tasks for people. Google has Bard, which is its assistant living on top of Gemini, which is its own uh, looking forward LLM. Microsoft, of course, has the co-pilot. Um, X, our friend Elon Musk, has something he's calling Grok, which um, I think, think it's fair to say it's had a somewhat rocky reception at the outset. Amazon has Q, and even Anthropic has something called Claude. So um, there's a realization that the underlying infrastructure, these LLMs, need to have a face, need to have a presence that people will feel comfortable with. And each of these companies um, have come to this notion that it is going to be this sort of intelligent agent. Well, again, what, what Vint and Bob back in 1988 called the no-bot. Um, and so looking ahead, you know, as we, we figure out what this landscape is going to start to look like, um, Bruce Schneier, who's a cybersecurity expert, um, has written an interesting article called AI and Trust. And trust is a key element here, right? Uh, as you think through what it will take to start revealing personal information to some of these companies and these bots in order for them to essentially train on us and utilize, we able to utilize them for, for um, hopefully positive proactive purposes for us. Um, Bruce has talked about what he calls the concern of the double agent. <laughs> so the idea that the agent ostensibly works on our behalf, but in fact, it's working for other people. Maybe it's working for the programmer, the developer, maybe it's working for the underlying company, maybe it's working for advertisers and marketers who, who are getting access to the insights that are being gleaned from all our interactions with the bot. So I would say the one takeaway I would leave with you all is how do we avoid the future of the double agent? How do we avoid a future where people in fact don't, either don't have trust in the, in the underlying, the fabric of the AI systems or probably more ominously uh, have sort of a fake trust. They assume certain things about what these agents are doing on our behalf. And in fact, they're doing things that maybe not directly in our interests. Um, so what is the role then in this, in this coming landscape, right? Of the underlying LLMs, then the, the personal language or small language models trained on them that become these intelligent agents, these bots. What is the role of the library here? And um, obviously you all know much better than I do the things you do today, and maybe some ideas you have for the future. I'll just do a few 
put a few things on the table and maybe this can be part of the conversation going forward. Some of this you're already familiar with and working with Don and, and over the over the space of time, the physical network side, right? So becoming the community hub in terms of infrastructure in the ground or in the air. So fiber, Wi-Fi, fixed wireless, being that place where people can get initial connectivity to the internet and to the web and perhaps now to some of these AI resources. Um, there's also the notion, of course, of being a repository of digital knowledge, something you know, as you all are moving from the analog to digital space and more and more of that information is, is online and available to people. Um, but now AI throws a new curve into the mix. So as I've talked about in a previous conversation with you all, one of the things I think is a really interesting leverage point for a library to consider is the notion of the fiduciary duty or the obligation, the way that you hold yourself out to a, a sense of, of care, of loyalty, of confidentiality, vis-a-vis um, -vis the patrons that you work with every day. Um, and that's something, frankly, none of these companies have. Uh, if you look at the terms of service online, look at their, their use, uh, you know, how, how they work with developers, how they work, of course, with advertisers and marketers, you are always an end user to them. And users, by definition, and I'm a lawyer, users essentially have no rights, <laughs> right? Um, a patron, on the other hand, there's, a, there's a, a notion of stewardship behind this. There's a notion, again, the sort of fiduciary relationship. I think that is a really interesting potential leverage point to consider in terms of how you interact with, with people that you serve in your communities. Um, and then there's the technology side, of course, uh, the AI agent, uh, a library could become an agent of its own, perhaps. Um, could sort of be a curation, uh, portable, ubiquitous curation of information and knowledge. Again, building on that trust factor. Um, it could also be a place where patrons create their own uh, AI bots or or uh, or no bots in the in the surf um, nomenclature. Um, these both of these obviously would require partnering with technologists, people who could, could you know put that put that technology to work. Um, but those both seem to me like eminently doable types of roles for a library. Um, and finally, could also be its own sort of LLM platform, could, could provide its own large language model curated not on the vastness of the web, um, but maybe curated on the, sort of the information as we would come to know it as, again, trustworthy sources of the ground truth that, that um, some of the other LLMs might have problems uh, actually putting together. And then, of course, uh, the educational side, helping people become not just digital citizens of the 21st century, but now sort of AI literacy for, for these same folks. Um, these are all, and I'm sure there are others, to me, are these potential roles that libraries could, could fill going forward as we look at this new landscape that's being shaped by the markets, by the technologies, by the public policy sector. Um, and I think these are all, all, all pathways that are fruitful worth, you know, fruitfully worth um, with exploring uh, at, at some point here. So I will stop and uh, hand this back to Don. Excellent, Richard. Uh, superb run through. I, you know, I need to play, replay that uh, in, in slow mo, I think, to, to get <laughs> that. But thank you. You packed it in. Um, and you reaffirmed the, uh, the issue of trust. And I think, like I say, I think it just, it just rises up as, you know, who are you going to trust? You have to trust somebody. You have to put your your digital life in the hands of somebody, like Google or or Facebook, or you know, it's a tough choice because these companies have not proven themselves to be, you know, working totally in your interests. Uh, and quickly, we need seen... to look at OpenAI. Which which version of OpenAI did you put your trust into? The one on November first, the one on December first, or the one on January first? Because those are three. Very different companies, very different leadership, um, terms yeah, of service right. that could change at the at the blink of an eye. So even if you say you have trust in an entity, a corporate entity, for example, that could go away in a heartbeat if things change in terms of how they govern themselves. Good, good point. I'm dedicated to 3.5. So I don't know what happened to that. Bring it back, please. <laughs> it was no. right. okay. Uh thanks, Richard. Stand by uh, and you know, load up your questions over there in the chat and we'll get to them so uh thanks andrew for posting the links there in the chat and so if you'll unmute andrew you can take it away and and give us a background on on the project the ai sig and and your work there thank you for being here
Thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to, to talk. It's, it's great. And uh, I'll try and keep my, my remarks fairly um, brief because we don't we want more discussion than uh, a kind of lecture, don't we? So, um, and I actually a lot of what Richard has said, I think we probably all would agree with things about, you know, you know trust in a library as an idea is like a really important asset that we've got there. Uh, it's important in this AI world. But in, uh, so what I really want to uh, talk about is um, some work we've been doing about thinking through maybe way to AI. Uh, it's not a definitive answer, obviously. It's a very changing environment. Um, but I hope we've touched on some things that are useful to people. And the work's being done really under the aegis of the IFLA Special Interest Group on Artificial Intelligence, which is part of IFLA, which is obviously the international body for libraries. Um, the SIG was set up uh, yeah, about 18 months ago. And we've done a few things, such as a guide for librarians to get up to speed on AI, We've done something about generative AI. We've done this document and our forum is quite a good place, I think now to keep up to date with the latest reports and publications on the topic. Um, so you might want to join that. I would invite you to join that, it's free. And it's quite useful. Um, and yeah, we just, and I'm from the information school at Sheffield. And so, Maybe I, for me to set the context, here's a little bit of uh, most of you guys, I guess, from the States, but in the UK, AI is also a massive strategic issue. We can see all sorts of national strategy. We can see our health service, the National Health Service have got an AI strategy. Our funders, the UCRI, that fund a lot of academic research, have got an AI strategy, and they are ploughing millions into AI research. I'm sh I think there's going to be a massive explosion of publication on AI in the next few years. That, that's almost inevitable. So within this strategic context of you know, governments saying something about AI, many of the sector bodies that our libraries work for are saying something about AI. Um, we've got to have some sort of response. I think it's worth looking at this study. I found this really useful. Um, it's a study of national strategies generally. It's a little bit old because things have changed in the last few months, perhaps. But um, one thing they're saying is recurrent themes across all national strategies are things that I think libraries have a role to play in. So. Developing human capital is the commonest theme across all these strategies. Every society is recognizing that they don't have the skills across the population. And where else do you come to learn skills but education institutions and libraries? Applying AI ethically is another very strong theme in these policies. And I think we as a profession have a really strong, uh, if you look at our a kind of response to generative AI. I think we're saying a lot of things that are a little bit different. We pick up the copyright issue. We pick up the exploitative way ChatGPT was developed. We pick up the potential impact on the AI information culture of you know millions of content being generated by robots. So I think there's a lot of, and I think going back to Richard's point about trust, I think we are institutions that can do something trustworthy in terms of responsible AI. So a point I'll come back to. Again, the third point, the recurrent theme in all national strategies is we've got to develop a research base about AI. Um, and again, so where are people going to come and read that research? But it's going to be libraries who are going to help publish that research as libraries. And regulation is another theme, and developing a data infrastructure policy. A thing that we sometimes begin to forget about AI, the current round of AI, is it's not magic, it's based on crunching loads of data. So that means data quality, 
data validity, data provenance, data management are key things. And I think information professionals actually know a lot about managing data successfully. So I think there's a lot going on at the sort of national level that it calls calling out to us as libraries that we've got a role to play here. And then the other part of this paper is to look at the differences of international policy. I think that's a good point because not everyone here is from the States. The UK and the States have rather similar sort of approaches to AI. I know it's been a little bit of a shift towards regulation and governance, um, but actually it's a pretty open market uh, where the state facilitates AI activity, but doesn't try to direct it. Very different from, say, China, which is another place where a very different form of AI is evolving, uh, where the state governs how AI is developed. And pretty different from Europe, where I think the legislation that's uh, just going to come out is going to be very much more concerned with the governing, the ethics and protection of the citizen. And I think pretty clearly ChatGPT could not have been created under that legal regime. So I think there's a divergence internationally of what policy looks like, as well as a lot of common ground. So that's a bit of a context. It's like there's a big strategic driver, many, many drivers in, in for AI, uh, in many areas of our lives. But if you look at institutional strategies and library strategies, they don't tend to have much about AI in them. But we know there's lots of ways AI could be used in a library context, from describing collections in new ways, to providing a bit like the assistance that Richard's saying is going to be the next big thing. I'm not sure I agree necessarily but i think the kind of stuff around chatbots not chat gpt like chatbot but more of a everyday chatbot i think that's probably something we could be doing more about um application of generative ai and everyday knowledge work is great for generating drafts and reports making office work more efficient and there's also the ai literacy dimension which i think uh, again, Richard mentioned, I totally agree with that. But there's many, many ways AI can be used in the library context. And it kind of crops up across all our functional teams. And sometimes it's a fundamental change, it offers fundamental changes, and sometimes not. And I think in different library sectors, the issue is different. So I think this is that's really the context for what we were trying to do in this document I'm going to talk about. It's like, it's a strategic priority, but it's a bit of a mess. It's quite hard to define what AI is. It's changing quite rapidly, but we shouldn't forget the sort of descriptive AI possibilities, not just focus on generative AI. Uh, sometimes it's fundamental, sometimes it isn't. How do we respond? So in the report, oh, I can look now, go over every single line of it, it would be a bit boring. Um, we kind of do things like look at a SWOT analysis of libraries in relation to AI. Again, I'm not going to talk through that because you can work out that in your own context. We thought about a few different types of strategies, and a lot of this is developed actually from experience with research data management, of the kind of responses libraries had um, in that case. And there was kind of a feeling that what determines our strategies is a lot to do with what existing skills we already have. How can we kind of translate those to the new context? Um, we tend to go for things that aren't resource intensive. We haven't got loads of resources, libraries, not a kind of rich sector. And we also, and I think again, Richard, I think brought this out well, I would use the word user, but we are a service oriented profession. It's all about, you know, thinking about what service, services users want and giving them to it, giving them those services. So it's all driven by user need in a way that a lot of the AI companies are. So those are what will probably determine our strategies, I think. 
you can read more of the analysis in the report. But what I thought I would focus on in this, this brief talk was the idea of AI capability, which I think is quite a powerful um, framework for thinking about AI. Um, and because it can be worked through in any sector you're working in. So what they say in the AI capability notion is like, well, what do you need to do AI? Well, first you need material resources. You need loads of data. You need user data. You need content data. You need, and there's question marks about, well, do we have this data? Actually, libraries don't like to collect user data. Um, they've got lots of content data, but they haven't got lots of user data necessarily. You need infrastructure and you need loads of resources to do. And that's why AI development's being driven by Google, uh, Microsoft and those, because they've got huge resources. We can't really match those. The other things you need are human resources. You need the technical skills around AI. And I think there might be a big focus on that in our minds that we, oh, we've got to learn Python or something like that. I don't think that is key for us. Maybe libraries in the US, I think, probably have more technical development capability than, say, in the UK. In the UK, we tend to buy systems. So it's more about how do we have the technical knowledge to buy the right system and inf how do we collectively influence the suppliers to produce the systems we want. The other thing you need is a different type of skill, is business skills, to actually implement projects around AI rather than you know technical know-how about algorithms or even about data so it's business skills and i think the library world has probably proven itself it's learned over a succession of new technologies coming into the sector and probably has got those business skills to implement new systems effectively and i think that is quite a powerful strength uh, I don't think it's that easy to implement AI systems in organizations. I think that could be a huge stumbling block, as well as the data issue. And then the other three things that the capability model says you need is intangible resources. And I think these are a leadership. It's about the ability to coordinate a response. And I think AI demands that in an extreme way because AI pops up in all your operations. It could be your back-end processes. It could be your customer services. It could be your collection. AI comes up all across the board. So I think coordinating response, how do we do that, is quite important. The ability to change and the willingness to take risk are other things that AI demand. And I think working through those things, I think for many libraries, actually, there's quite a lot of barriers um, around data, around technical skills, around the confidence to respond, and the willingness to take risk is also an issue in the library sector. So I think that's quite a good framework for evaluating your own capability or your institution's capability. And maybe the library's just, maybe the library's just uh, maybe got data skills, and we're talking about like a university, it was the university's AI capability. Maybe we can be a pocket of excellence around data thing. But my sort of uh, final point, I don't want to talk too much, is three examples of things I think we can do that would be very useful in an AI context. And it's not definitive, and I think Richard mentioned some other things. But the first thing is I think Implementing responsible AI, explainable AI solutions is not something that the big multinational, you know, the big corporations do very well. We may not be able to do it on the same scale, but we can do it well. And there's lots of like good practice and thought being put into things like the Vancouver Statement on Collections of Data, I think gives us really good sense of the kind of issues. And I think there's a good lot of knowledge in the library sector about how to do these, think through the processes of doing, you know, we're spending a lot of time on decolonizing our, our curriculums, our collections. We need to think through doing AI in an ethical way, in the same way. There's lots of 
There's lots of barriers and problems and turning those solutions into services is the biggest one. But I think that is something that the library world can contribute and it fits into Richard's point about you know, trust. The second thing that I think we can offer to organizations is some sort of data capabilities. We don't talk that much about data. We talk about information, knowledge, evidence a lot of the time. But actually, a lot of our skills are really around data, but we could, with a little bit of effort, apply to the data world. So I think data stewardship, skills in finding data, data governance, understanding the copyright around data, metadata, um, preserving in the long term data. These are skills that are highly important. They're much more infrastructural than the flashy front end of AI, but they're essential for the AI world. Um, so that's really important. And the third thing is around boosting the AI capability of our organizations and uh, citizens as well. It's about promoting AI literacy. And that fits in very well, I think, with academic skills training and information literacy training. We've got some models of what AI literacy is that I'm not sure are adequate. And I think there's a lot of problems with AI literacy. It's a very broad concept. Um, AI is changing. We've seen in the last years, basically what we think AI is has changed. But also, I think a lot more AI is hidden in the infrastructure than obviously in use. When we use ChatGPT, we know it's AI. Half the time when we're using different platforms, it's AI too, but we don't think of it in that way. So it's that algorithmic literacy is the term that people want to talk about, understanding the hidden operation of AI and helping the user to understand that. AI is hard to understand because it's based on statistics and computational methods that we probably don't understand. AI is not particularly explainable anyway because the outcomes of algorithms isn't really that easy to explain. It's kind of, even the designers don't really know how to explain it. So that's another obstacle to explainability. And ultimately, I think big tech doesn't really want explainable AI. This is a real problem. So I think AI literacy is something we should be thinking about how we define it and promoting it. But I don't think it's going to be that easy, an easier task. But I do think those three things are really important things that we in the library world can do. Build trustworthy, responsible, ethical AI solutions, even if they're small scale. They can do some really good work around improving access to collections. Talking more about our data skills and transferring our ethics and our data, our information skills to data and promoting AI literacy. So I think, I think in the... There might be other things we can do that probably are, you know, developing large language models based on our own data. That um, Richard mentioned that. I think that's um, really important. Um, but I'll just close with like a few of the questions I think are really important. If we have a vision for what AI can be in our library context, we can probably make it happen. Uh, but if we have no vision, we can't make it happen. Um, how does AI fit into the wider digital transformation agenda? Um, they go back to this idea of AI capability. What's our, our capability and where should leadership, where in our organizations are we going to, who are we pointing at who should lead on AI? What competences do we really need? Are they really a technical ones or are they more about confidence to try things out, to take risk and do projects. Uh, who are the internal and external collaborators? Where are the role models and the case studies? And I'll finish on questions rather than answers uh, because I'm, I'm not really bringing answers. I'm bringing hopefully some interesting ways of thinking about the issue. I think that's what the, the, the report tries to do. So I'll finish there. Wow. <laughs> That's great, Andrew. Um, it's just 
I mean, it's daunting, right? So uh, it's a beautiful roadmap that you've laid out there. I'm, besides all the various questions inside of that, is uh, how, how can an institution that's less than a university tackle all those questions? How can a library or a group of libraries possibly deal with all those questions? I mean, it's it's really impressive and daunting. So what's the practical use of, of the strategy development tool? Well, I think you can, you can see that something like AI literacy, where does that fit into what we already do? Actually, it can be folded into a lot of information literacy type stuff. Um, for example, uh, data scientists, they need to find data. They need to look for, search for data. And searching for data is pretty hard. But librarians know about that infrastructure. They know how to search for stuff. They know how to evaluate it. Um, we already teach people how to do literature reviews. Increasingly, there are AI tools that are used for that kind of activity. So picking up those things that are close to what we already do and highly relevant, that seems to be part of it. And then I guess somebody's written there, Diane's written about proof of concept. Um, you know, if we can pick out some collections that we want to do a bit of work around creating a new way of navigating them, particularly if we haven't got in-depth metadata on that particular collection, that's a great feels like a great starting point for exploring creating one of these kind of you know trusted explainable ai solutions um, and that in itself is like educating users as well but i mean i don't know really i don't know the answers i'm just here to post okay, okay. <laughs> we're all grasping for this at this uh phenomena uh diane did post a link they've created uh diane runs a, a small library in north texas and they've created an interesting little tool to guide people through the uh their services and, and collections and, and how they trained it was also interesting they just collected all the questions that came in and converted that into an automation uh i'm not sure what elizabeth's post is about but probably interesting to check out. Richard, do uh, you have any uh, follow-up or um, questions for Andrew? Yeah, no, I, you know, a lot of this does come down to the resources, right? Sort of the how question that you said, Don. So, you know, it seems to me there may be interesting partnerships to be had with, with tech companies. Obviously it has to be done in the right way and um, out of the right sort of governance, but I um, was curious your take on that. Also, by the way, I just came across an article this morning in the New York Times, uh, on uh, public school systems and this notion that every student should have their own bot, right? And there's folks from OpenAI and some other of the tech companies quoted there. Intriguing, potentially very useful. But again, if this is all being come out of the private sector, I'm concerned about what the actual motivations are underlying that. It occurred to me that could be an interesting partnership between libraries and school systems where, again, sort of the ground truth around education materials, information, that students can drop on if there in fact are to be a bot, is to be a bot for every student, maybe the libraries can be assisting in terms of what shaping what that looks like and not necessarily end of the day is something that, you know, Sam Altman is shaping for all of us. Indeed. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, what, what, what's your take on engaging with uh, the, the tech industry? What, what could what would a partnership possibly look like where you could appeal to the tech industry to partner with libraries to achieve i don't know political goals or policy or even market goals <clears throat> well i guess one model of collective engagement with the um, commercial suppliers is to get together as libraries and articulate what we want from them. Um, that's not exactly an equal collaboration. It's more like, well, it's more like trying to build up libraries as you know, having a collective voice 
to deal with very large companies with lots of power. Um, so I think that that could be an approach. Um, uh, just to pick up on the idea of every student having a chat bot or having a you know, personal bot. Of course, if you've got more money, you'll have a better bot. Uh, that's the problem. Um, well, a problem. Um, and then it becomes, you know, like, how do you distinguish between the work of the student and the, the bot? But I think we have to face these problems. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. maybe institutionally selected agents yeah. is a better approach yeah. than just allowing people to subscribe to whatever they want. All right. Richard, where, which part of these massive companies would tend to engage in this conversation, even be open to having a chat about it? Good phrase. question. I mean, some of the larger ones like Google um, have an actual public sector side and arm where they, you know, they see themselves sort of selling into government. And I think certainly over the years for things like Google Print, where, you know, they were doing all of the um, making cop digital copies of of um, analog books, right? There were some partnerships that they struck with the libraries. Um, so that's another side of, at least on the Google, where I'm familiar since I worked there for a while. Um, and I think Meta and, and Amazon, some others have similar sort of public sector side arms that that see themselves as, as forming these partnerships uh, with the government government uh, sector. I think I think that makes sense uh, because you know it's interesting to see these companies go before uh, government and say yes, please regulate us, knowing full well that they're creating a impossible uh, challenge for government who can. You know, generally, you know, they're surprised at Facebook. How, how are they going to handle, you know, uh, complex algorithm regulation? Uh, it's a way to sort of pose as open and amenable to being regulated at the same time. Uh, they know the complexity, the difficulty of actually doing that. You know, it's a good it's a good public relations move that doesn't seem to really have much, uh, much impact. Uh, one one other question I had about so many of the of the issues and practical challenges that you posed andrew and and richard uh point to a skill set that you know doesn't seem to exist and so you you have an i school uh, there at sheffield do you have a track for ai librarians would that would that make sense for to specialize in that i we have a data science program, but um, yeah. not for librarians. I don't. I don't think librarians should stop being librarians. I think we've got to work out how our skills are relevant, and they are highly relevant. Like I'm trying to say about you know, managing data, data stewardship, finding data, preserve, preservation, metadata. We know a lot about data. Don't use the word that much, but we know a lot. Um, right. It's more about, say, you know, defining the vision of what you could do in a voluntary context. I think that's more important than, than trying to train librarians to write code or um, develop models or be AI practitioners. I don't think that's the right, right direction. Um, All right. Okay. Excuse uh, my opinion. Uh, okay, that's what I asked for. Your opinion. Diane points out the value of prompts in this in this world, and that's uh, that's one of the skills that librarians definitely could uh, and must be developing. So I see a hand from our old friend Stephen Abram. Stephen, thanks, Don. I I, I think this is a, an incredibly interesting discussion, and we've uh, w what I see happening, or at least in my opinion, because I'm. I've integrated AI into my courses at uh, the University of Toronto, and I've only implemented that students reflect, not decide or take a position, because I think in the first year you're reflecting, 
I think we need to remember that AI is in the humanity space, not the science space, one year old. You can't look at a one year old and say, it's a lousy accountant, let's throw it out. You can dream for what you want them to be. So what I'm, what we started with was talking about guardrails. And I think the guardrails piece is exceptionally important. But I think what's more important is we need a collaborative <clears throat> in our field to segment libraries and talk about use cases. When we start to leap to saying we need a partnership or an alliance or influence and be at the table with the commercial enterprises, and OpenAI is a not-for-profit, but it's commercial. And so when we look at this, we need to arrive at that table with a deeper understanding of the short-term and long-term use cases. And so that we know what we might want out of this and where those guardrails apply with things like privacy and confidentiality and harvesting versus uh, when is this a tool that allows us to build pathways through research to make discoveries? We've already seen amazing discoveries on new kinds of batteries and uh, new kinds of uh, clinical uh, data use with genetics and stuff to find pathways for research. It's very, very powerful. And then human beings need to review it and see where the guardrails need to be and where the faults might be. But it's taking us through leaps and bounds. So I think we need to build a collaborative that isn't talking about regulation, isn't talking about guardrails. It's talking about what is the potential in an open-minded way for a use case variance for this works for academia, this works for researchers, this works for uh, higher ed, this works for public libraries, this works for school libraries. So I'll stop ranting. But uh, I, I, I think that's where we should be putting some effort right now. It's like looking at your one-year-old and saying, am I going to put my kid in French immersion because I know a second language will make them a, a better person, a better thinker? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. As ever, uh, good, good thoughts there. Uh, Fiona posts about the Toronto public uh, is a leader, actually, in the use of AI. Uh, and it was actually someone from the library there that uh, helped us kick off our first AI session over two years ago. Uh, so if there's, Fiona, if there's a, a link or uh, more detailed information about what you're doing there, please post it. Um, this this notion of double agent, Richard, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, it's alarming, but, you know, it's a way to say it out loud that, you know, how can it be personal if it's provided by a third party that has a commercial interest that controls it, that ultimately, how, do, how does it actually work to, to protect from the interest of the provider of the first so-called personal tool? Yeah, no, it's really, I, I'll try to find before the calls over here, I'll try to find the Bruce Schneier um, piece. He wrote it just within the last month. And it is called, I think, AI and Trust. And he talks a lot about trust in terms of we have sort of personal trust and social trust um, in institutions and in people around us. And that one of the real challenges we're seeing with the AI, if we move into this sort of agent spot space, which I think is pretty much inevitable, um, that the companies who supply them are going to do their very best to confuse us with the type of trust that we're giving so that, you know, I can trust perhaps United Airlines to get me safely home over the weekend, over the last few days, I've, that trust has been shaken a bit, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, but they don't personalize their jets. They don't put a name to it. They don't make it act like it's my friend. Um, although you know, again, their advertising might try to lead us that way a little bit, but the bot is very much going to be positioned that way. It's not just an assistant. It's going to be something that's there all the time to do our bidding, to help us out. And we're going to start to think of it, anthropomorphize it in a way that it is a personal thing and that trust will go deeper and that these companies will take advantage of that. That's basically Bruce's point. And so when he talks about the double agent, it is the, the front, the, the interface that seems like it is 
um, a trusted friend and advisor to us, whereas the backstory is very different. Um, so again, I'll try to find that piece and, and stick it in the chat here. Okay, good. That's great. That's great. Uh, the so we're we're at the hour. Uh, this is not a uh, TV show per se, so we're not hard bound, but we want to uh, you know take care of the time here. So uh, Andrew, any final point or statement you'd like to make to close us out? I've talked enough, really, but um, what can I say? Um, I hope people will read the document. It's not definitive, obviously. It's something trying to say something uh, while events are changing all around. So if people want to send me comments, I'll be, it's a working document. We want to improve it. And if you've got case studies of things you're doing, like we heard from public library there that's really good material but it should be integrated in a future version so very good and your your contact is on that paper and people can reach you directly there you can, go ahead and, if you want put your email in the chat if you if you feel like it uh richard uh, that was a pretty good last word but you probably have another last word for us sorry just responding to kent in the chat um no look i think this is a great conversation and Trust, I think, is is the watchword I would take out of this is um, libraries govern themselves in different ways than even the the nonprofits and the so-called C, C Corps that some of these, you know, the AI companies claim to be, you know, adopting as their governance structures. So lean into the trust and find, I think, find those gaps. And I think they're growing gaps in society where you can use that trust, leverage that trust in ways that bring benefits to people, to the patrons who serve every day. Um, that would be sort of my takeaway. Right. Wonderful. So uh, we'll call that a wrap, though. This conversation obviously is going to go on. Uh, we plan to, this, by the way, is our kickoff session for the for the year. But, but we plan to return to the topic. Uh, hopefully we can uh, focus on this uh, at least once a month for the next half a year or something as we're all trying to get our heads around it even as it keeps expanding. Uh, we're particularly interested in this, the use case to for assisted learning. It seems like that being able to tailor an individual, I can see the attraction and you know all the issues, but the, the potential to accelerate learning by having a dedicated, highly informed uh, guide, tutor uh, is, is 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 fascinating however that of course leads to a lot of other questions there are always going to be more questions so with that uh i want to thank our speakers andrew and richard for taking the time and holding forth today we'll have the recording up as soon as we can and i look forward to watching it again and hope you all will too and come back next time so with that we'll sign off and say thanks again and see you next time